So hello Achiever, today I am with a, an awesome guest and I'm very glad to do this new interview in San Diego, no, sorry, in La Jolla, we, in an awesome hotel also. I am with Denis Whiteley, he's one of the American's most respected author, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and on high performance and psychology of winning, he, he wrote a lot of books and he's so inspiring, he's with me to answer my question. So hello Denis. Hey, it's good to be with you David. How are you? Terrific. Terrific, perfect. Uh, I have a lot, a lot of questions to ask you, so I have to choose. But my first question, it is about you. I would love to, um, to listen to your story and especially the beginning of your story. And how did you start it? And what was the, tr the trigger uh, who helped you to, to become so successful? And also the struggles. I love learning the struggles and how you overcame it and what did you learn from this struggle? Well, I think the most important thing is I came from a, a poor family. <coughs> yes. So many uh, people who are achievers come out of the ghetto or, or overcome to prove something. So I grew up in a family that had <coughs> low self-esteem. Uh, my father never accomplished anything. Uh, he drank too much and smoked too much and uh, left home when I was nine. So I became the man of the family when I was nine years old. Wow. We had a uh, brother and sister and my mother was <coughs> resentful that uh, my father left. So she, in a way, punished us for having to take care of us and earn money as well as take care of us. So we did our chores and uh, she was pretty uh, tough on us. And so I grew up feeling inadequate, feeling uh, average or below average. And yet I had this burning desire inside. Why do some people become successful, hmm. although they're not good looking? Why are they high achievers, although they're not like movie stars? Why are they great in business and yet haven't had any training? What is it that separates people to become what they want instead of what they, their uniform is? So I was wearing a uniform of mediocrity and of, <laughs> of a lower class. And I remember my mother said something that was indelible for the rest of my life. I would do my chores, mow the lawn, clean up my room, and do everything to try to make it easier for her. And then I would put on my baseball uniform and get my baseball glove and my cap and go out to play baseball. And she would say, it must be nice for you to be able to go play with your friends while your mother has to slave over your dinner. But that's okay, don't worry about me, I'll be all right. And I felt really guilty in enjoying myself or having fun. And so I learned that the best defense for that kind of attitude was to flip it. So I developed an ability to flip everything negative that she said into something positive. How did you do that? Can you have an example? Well, she would say, uh, it's terribly hot today. And I said, it's gonna be a good day for the beach. She would say, oh, look at the rain. I said, great for the flowers. She would say, uh, your, your room needs more cleaning. I said, I'll do it better tomorrow. She would say, you can't trust anyone in this world. And I said, you can trust a friend. And so whatever she would say negative, I would try to make something positive out of it, out of self-protection. But the key for me was my grandmother. Well, my grandmother lived uh, 20 miles away. So you can imagine a nine, 10 year old boy being hammered by, by his environment, riding my bicycle 20 miles one way to mow her lawn because I knew what was gonna happen to me when I got there. She would say, here he comes. Here comes that wonderful young man who's gonna really be a great, great person. You really mow a good lawn. And because you mow such a good lawn, you deserve a big piece of apple pie. She said, <laughs> wow, look at that lawn. And then we, it was during World War II, so there was no television. So I grew up in radio. So I have developed a phonographic memory. 
So my memory is that I can remember everything I hear. If I hear it more than once, I have it forever. It really works well when you're speaking, Yeah. except that you must give credit to the people that you heard it from rather than taking it as your own. So I do like to give credit for all the things I've learned. But my grandmother and I planted a victory garden during the war, World War II, and we put uh, vegetables and, and flowers, and it was just amazing. Whatever was on this little package, the bloom, she said it would come up if we planted it and took care of it that way. I said, but how do you know? She said, because whatever you put in the soil, if you yourself take care of it, she said, now remember, weeds come in unannounced and uninvited. So the weeds will always come. They don't even need watering. I said, why don't weeds need watering if flowers do? And she said, that's just the nature of life. The weeds come in and you focus on the flowers and the vegetables. Whatever we put in the soil, I guarantee you will come up because, oh my grandson, you are planting the seeds of greatness in the soil of your mind. And I <laughs> never, ever forgot that. And you have a book with this title. <laughs> yeah, and, and she was the prologue and the epilogue. So she has been the one anchor and beacon in my life. Of all the women I've ever met or ever known, she's by far my greatest role model. So I'll always rem I think of her almost every day. Because when I go to bed at night, I say, Grandma, here we go again, safe again. It's amazing because my grandfather is a farmer. Um, he gave me a lot of metaphors about um, seeds and how the, the things grow. And I love to share that in my speeches and conferences, what I learned from my grandfather, because I, I see a lot of parallel with the nature and our own evolution. I love that. I think so too. And it really is, we are gardeners. Uh, there's no question, we garden and the weeds will come in, they'll, they'll always arrive. And there are pests that come in. And so there's no guarantee that the garden will ever be perfect because it changes every day. So I, I like that about life. The garden is never finished. <laughs> yeah, and it's our own responsibility to take care of this garden. Definitely. <laughs> and how did you uh, start it to, how did you decide to become a speaker and how did you do that? Well, I think when you're little, you lo love to do certain things. So if you, er <coughs> if you find out early what you love to do, for me it was read, write, and talk, <laughs> and sing. Read, write, talk, sing. So in my early years, I read a lot. My library card was more important than a master card. So I had a library card and I read every book I could get my hands on. I read a book a week, still do, read a book every week because uh, it takes you where you can't go in person. And uh, listening to the radio enabled me to develop an imagination where I didn't need to see or have graphics or PowerPoints or video to tell the story. I could be a storyteller in my imagination because I grew up without with, this kind of effect. Just listening to the radio. And when I was little, I put on programs at school, became the mayor of the school, the president of the student body, governor of Boy State, and after dinner speaking. But then my career switched completely because uh, the Korean War broke out. So when there's a war, you must go to war. So I became a uh, Navy carrier-based jet pilot and I became a warrior, which I didn't enjoy, but it was fun to fly. So I had an interruption of about nine years of flying off a carrier. But meanwhile, I was writing poetry and playing with the clouds and talking and thinking, although that's not really a warrior's mentality. But I knew even when I was a warrior that, that I was never going to stay a warrior, that I was going to develop people rather than defend or destroy them. Mm. Great. So you, you came back from this, this war and you decided to, to build something in this field? 
Well, what I learned uh, as a Navy pilot was goal setting, targeting, and the automatic pilot in your mind. And the more I read and the more I learned, I began to work with prisoners of war that came back from uh, North Vietnam or from Korea. And I found that no prisoner escaped from a minimum security camp, but many prisoners escaped from a maximum security camp. Now understand, why would you escape if it was more difficult? Why would you not try to escape if it was easy? It's because of your mindset. Leaders always try to get home and the people who are just being there just are afraid and so they don't take action. I learned that about prisoners of war. I learned that the more specific you are about where you're going, the more you'll get there. Mm. And the more nebulous you are, the more vague you are, you will just be part of, of the masses. And most people are thermostats. No, no, they're thermometers. A thermometer reflects the environment. A thermostat sets it internally and then sets the bar. So I, I learned that and then I worked with uh, the Apollo program. So Whoa. having been a, a Navy pilot, my roommates having been astronauts, I began to give some stress management seminars to Apollo astronauts. Then I really got interested and went ahead and got a doctorate in human behavior. And that set me off on a, a more scientific way of thinking about the mind. So I'm more cerebral than, than most of the other motivators, which means that I'm not as exciting as they are because I don't jump around and talk about the deep hypnotic power within you. You know, I'm, I'm not like Anthony Robbins. I'm, I'm cerebral in the sense that I know that the mind is the most magnificent biocomputer ever created and that it, uh, it deals in the most automatic subconscious way and that we are creations of habit. So I'm a habit master. My whole life is how do you master your habits because losing and winning are habit forming. 90% of what you do every day is reflexive. Olympians don't try to win, they remember. So an Olympian does not say, you know, I've got to bear down, I've just got to win. Olympian has learned how to win, has gone through the motions, has gone through the training and all they need to do is at that moment when the pressure's on, remember, reflex. So the mindset of a champion is internalizing the kinds of habits that will get you where you wanna go rather than getting in your own way. And I think I learned that more from astronauts going somewhere dangerous, no one's gone before. Olympians going somewhere in the moment where they haven't gone before and a prisoner of war unable to go anywhere but having to go there only in your mind. So I, I really believe in feed forward and feedback. Imagination serves the goal. Memory serves the reinforcement of success. Memory brings what you've learned to the present back to the present and the imagination brings the future to the present and the mind is unable to distinguish between something that is vividly imagined and that which is really happening. So memory serves the person who wants to reinforce the good life and the life that they want to lead and the life that they may have experienced in some way. So memory is tremendous when, when things are getting rough. Imagination serves the entrepreneur because the imagination takes you into the future like a pilot in a movie. But you can't distinguish whether it's really happening or not. It is so real and so vivid and so emotional that you're actually living the future and the present and memory enables you to live the past and the present. Tremendous capability of the mind to, to do that. Mm, I, love, I love the way you, you, you speak about imagination. It's amazing. Yeah. Imagination is fabulous. Wow. <laughs> Do you think we can develop this imagination? D we can what? D uh, de develop it. Oh, of course. It's a skill like anything else. We all have it. Just a question of whether we're using it. 
Most people use it as premonition. They use it as worry. They, they, they think of things that could happen, might happen, they hope won't happen. They look through the rearview mirror where they're coming from instead of through the windshield to where they're going. And imagination rules the world, there's no question about it. I mean, everything that is not natural is the product of a human mind. Absolutely unbelievable. Everything that we touch that is not made of the natural world was invented by a, a mind. Some human being that said, wow, why not? So I love to study the people who solve problems by using their imagination. Did you know that the outboard motor was invented by a uh, Ole Ebenrude? Ole Ebenrude was rowing his boat across the lake in Wisconsin, but the ice cream cone melted that he was bringing his girlfriend, so he couldn't row fast enough, so he invented a motor to put on a boat so he could get the ice cream faster to his girlfriend. <laughs> That's the use of the imagination. Now we all have outboard motors on our little boats, but it was because of this one guy that said, I just have to do something. And I look at all the inventions, and they were almost all to solve a problem, not to make money. And therein may lie the whole secret of getting rich. Getting rich is a byproduct of being passionate about filling a need or solving a problem. And you got rich not because you planned on it, but because you were so passionate about filling that need that more people wanted it. And if you'll interview uh, Bill Gates or if you'll interview any of the great entrepreneurs, I, they'll, I would love to do that. Yeah, they'll tell you they never intended to be the richest person ever. They, they never intended to be a billionaire. They just intended to do this incredibly interesting, exciting, passionate thing to solve some kind of problem that they felt they had. And, that's what I love about being an entrepreneur. But if you want to make money, and that's all you think about, you may make some money, but money, uh, you'll be its slave. You'll be money slave, and money will be the thing that becomes so important to you. It becomes your scoreboard for success. And I think money is just fuel. M money's only gas for the tank. Mm. I love what you're saying. Great. Yeah, so we have to focus on how we can help people solve problems, and maybe the money will be a consequence of how we solve this problem. That's right. Well, it will, you know, especially if the need is, is a, a big one that many people have. So if you can save people time and money, you'll have all the time and the money you need because people are so under stressed, they're you know, overstressed, they're under stress, but overstressed. So if you can save them time, which you can't really save, you can only spend it, but you can spend it wisely. And that's what we try to do with applications and technology. We try to save people a little more time and we try to save them money on the, the routine things they do and that makes people a fortune. Mm. Or we make life easier for them. The automatic dishwasher was invented by a woman whose maid kept breaking her china. So the maid would wash the dishes and break her china, so she came up with an automatic dishwasher that would not break her plates. <laughs> but she didn't do it in order to make a fortune on dishwashers. And if you look at, just look at every invention. The telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, his sister was hard of hearing. So he was inventing a hearing device so his sister could hear him better, but it became the telephone. So it wasn't... It wasn't the intended idea to sit around with a group of people saying, you know, how are we going to get rich? I mean, how are we going to get just incredibly filthy rich? And that way we can accomplish all our goals and travel everywhere in the world and have everything we want because the Chinese are trying to do that. The Chinese have a mistaken idea of what success is. The Chinese believe that success is material wealth. They, uh, they have lost for many, many years that philosophical soul that they had yeah. that's 5,000 years old. So instead of looking at all these incredible philosophies that they've had, they're looking at Bentley, Escada, Chanel, 
Louis Vuitton, uh, Mercedes, they're looking at the symbols of status that has become the Western way of, of keeping score. And one of the things that worries me is that if we're not careful, we become skin deep. And skin deep means that we wear our values externally. You can see them in what we drive, what we wear, in our movements, our actions, the people we run around with, the, the, the clothes we wear, the jewelry we have, the status that we have, and we're comparing ourselves externally while not really going inside. So if I were to write another book, I would write Skin Deep, The Great Culture of Materialism. But I don't want to be negative. And when you tend to get older, sometimes you begin to get critical. <laughs> and the worst thing you can do when you're older is to be an old grumpy critic. So instead, I want to be part of the future. I don't want to be a critic. Great. I would love to know, according to you, for what reason did you become so successful in your field? I think to overcome inadequacy. I mean, the greatest actors, some of the greatest actors in the world were trying to be somebody else. So if you really want to know, that most of the speakers I know uh, thrive on approval. They really do. If you look at them, they thrive on the approval of others. So I have to be careful. But do, you, do, you, do you have <coughs> an example? How, how did you, how they do that? What they do is they give a presentation and the audience comes to their feet and applauds them. And it feels so good to get a standing ovation for something that you did, a performance that you had. Because if you weren't getting it at home, if you weren't feeling it inside, you have to get some external reference point. So it might be uh, making a fortune, it might make you feel good. Let's say you were an orphan and didn't have any money, so you made money and it made you feel important. I think that uh, many times uh, it starts out getting the approval of others. But fortunately for me, I passed that probably in my 30s. I gave up any idea of conceit. I don't feel that I'm better than anyone who's ever been born. I'm as good as the best, but no better than the rest. I look at a taxi driver as a transportation executive. I do not feel more important than any person I've ever met. So I'm not impressed. And I'm not impressed with people who try to impress. So the people that appear impressive are desperate for attention. The people that shout the loudest are calling for help. The people that make the big show need it because they actually need this approval. That's why the stretch limousine comes into play. The longer the stretch, the more they need to stretch the way they appear. And only people I think with authentic self-esteem can afford to be modest and usually are. So the greatest people I've ever met are very humble very modest, very engaging, don't talk a lot about themselves, don't talk about their books. And the, the ones that I see in my profession who are the most skin deep are ones that are talking about what I've done, where I've been, who I know, what, you know, what I've accomplished. They get so self-involved. And the best thing is to take the value that you create and, and let it go, give it away. If you're that valuable, wouldn't you want to share it with, with everyone you meet? Why would you want to possess value? Why wouldn't you want to share it if you had so much? So I really believe that uh, the more successful you are, yeah. the more engaging, the more warm, the more gracious, the more gratitude, the nicer and more giving you should be. And I, and I believe that, that that separates for me the truly successful person and the one who is the actor, the celebrity, the, uh, the one who when they walk out, everyone cheers. And it feels good, uh, make no mistake, it feels good to be featured. But I would much rather have the respect of, of one child than the adoration of the masses. I'd rather have 
I'd rather be an example for my grandchildren than have, have an arena full of people come to their feet. Great. So let, let's consider I am your grand, grandson and because I think you are maybe uh, same age of my grandfather. And what could, and I am in, in a field that uh, looks like yours, what could be the, the best advice you would give me to succeed, not al to succeed in this field as an author and speaker, not only succeed with money, but succeed in your opinion with Amber and everything. So what could be your five advice you would give me if, if you were my mentor or my grandfather? First, I would say that uh, you don't have to prove your value that all the value you'll ever get, you got when you were created. So that uncut gemstone, that diamond that, it, that is you, does not need to be cut and polished so much to make it more valuable. You're as valuable as anyone who's ever been born or whoever will be born, and that intrinsic value, you must hang on to that and believe in, in this dream even if it's all you have it to hang on to. So I believe that, that the true winner believes in that dream even though they have nothing to prove so far. So I think performance reflects value, doesn't measure it. So you don't need to perform to feel valuable. You need to feel valuable to perform at your highest level. So first you internalize it and you say, you know, given my parents and my background, I'm glad I'm me. I may not be the best looking in the group, I look my best in a group, and I have something to offer that is so unique and so different. And I'm going to develop myself to a life of being a role model, mentor, coach, example for everyone I meet. And I'm going to make everyone I meet say, I'm so glad I talked to you. I'm so glad I met you. You gave me so much, and you didn't ask for anything in return. You just gave. Mm. No quid pro quo here. No, no something for something. No, you give me this, I pay you. You're, you're giving. I would say that would be the beginning. Then I would say that you should model yourself after people who truly have done, not just written about it, but have done what they say they've done. Not just a clever speaker, not just someone who's gifted with oratory, <clears throat> but someone who has had success by association. Someone who, uh, who writes about what he believes in and is a prolific writer. And as your grandfather, I would say, there are many books in you. So don't try to make your book a Picasso. A book is a book that needs to be written and you, you, you do not perfect it, you write it. And it demands to be written and to be published. And that's one. But it is not the book of my life because each book that you write will have a different meaning and a different time in your life. So you'll write many books and don't just try to have the defining book. Uh, lots of e-books. Uh, remember, people are scanners rather than readers and they, they look in sound bites and video bites and in blogs. So you have to have uh, shorter, shorter messages and more books and, and you know, fewer number of pages. And uh, when I say model yourself after people, make sure that it's not just those who are good salesmen. I've been telling speakers uh, most of my career, did you know I have not ever once held up a book or audio of my own and talked about it, not once, not ever, nor will I. There's a differentiation between someone who is a teacher and someone who's a salesman. Now, now that it's a very fine line. Brian Tracy, one of the best. Uh, Zig Ziglar, one of the best. John Maxwell, one of the best. They have, uh, perfected the ability to not only write prolifically and speak prolifically, but they also sell prolifically. 
And there's been a trend over the last decades for a speaker to also be a dynamic salesperson because there's been this feeling that unless you can sell your stuff from the back of the room, then how are you ever going to get anyone's attention because we have such a internet overload and it's so difficult to get your stuff up through the, uh, the noise. So you really do have to be an entrepreneur. You have to have something different and unique. But if I were to give you advice, I would say have someone else, which has worked so great for me. I've always had someone else get up there and just talk about everything I've done, but I've never talked about it. If you're a teacher, you got the real thing. You don't have to sell your stuff. If it's that good and in demand, the Master of Ceremonies does it. The, uh, the, the Vice President of Marketing, the promoter sells it. And the promoter says, you know, David is such an unbelievably uh, authentic, modest, real person that um, he's not going to give you a pitch on his stuff. He doesn't need to. It sells itself, but we will because we talked him into bringing uh, his library. <clears throat> and we've also asked him if he'd be willing, and he, he said he'd be willing to stay as long as you want to autograph them or to answer any questions that you have uh, about them. And I've ended up selling almost as much material as Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar. In fact, I've sold more audios than anyone in the world. Uh, $100 million worth of audio programs never having talked about one because I always have somebody else. And I go, gee whiz. And they go, Den you know, Dennis wouldn't, Dennis isn't going to say anything about it. He's not going to tell you about the special of the day. He's not going to tell you what you're going to get at this program. We'll tell you that because he's just too modest. He's here to teach, not to sell. To me, that's really good advice. And, and there's a way for you to do it, for you to be the best salesperson in the world without having to overtly give yourself a commercial. You don't have to be the one doing it. And it, it's a fine art, but I think you can develop that and I think it will set you apart. Great. Because Tony Robbins and I have talked about this <coughs> excuse me, over and over again. And Zig, Zig Ziglar said, Dennis, you left a lot of money on the table through the years, you know. I said, well, Zig, you sell pots and pans and sandwiches and you're one of the greatest salesmen in the world. And everyone knows you're going to put the clothes on them and they love you for it. And Brian's one of the great closers. The last 15 to 20 minutes of every one of his talks, he talks about the books and he's prolific in that. And he sells and makes a lot of money doing that. But you have to decide, are you, are you the consummate salesman? Is that how you want to be known as the consummate sales master? Or do you want to be the master teacher, master motivator? It's a great question. And, and that, that's um, about the third bit of advice I would give. I guess the other would be you don't need to copy anyone else's style. I mean, when Zig used to get down on one knee, all the other speakers got down on one knee. And when people started jumping around and yelling, then other people started jumping around and yelling. And now in China, the motivational speakers all yell because they're used to the 1980s American speakers who would get up and say, fire it up, fire it up. Uh, yes, say yes. You know, they, they were used to hearing the speakers that would try to get the audience echoing what they were saying. So now the Chinese are all mimicking each other and, it's, uh, and they think that's the way to speak is to just leap around and just be jumping up and down like, like a rock concert. And some speakers are really good at that, really good at motivating, really good at that power. Tony Robbins is good at that. Uh, Joel Olstein, I guess you would say, but he's more you know, the Christian type, uh, he's more the, the Christian orator. Jim Rohn is more the put the reading glasses on, <laughs> sit on a stool in front of a, 
yes. a whiteboard, and everyone has their style. And I would say, uh, your style, your way, and then just be as authentic as you can. But there are too few of you. I mean, I don't know of any other people like you <laughs> coming up. No, I don't. Well, I'll give you some positives. Uh, the way you speak is very important because you have the gift of, of dialect. And the gift of dialect, whether it's French or Australian, is absolutely important to have something unique about your delivery, about who you are and the way you come across. That's going to be, that's going to serve you well. Uh, in, in front of English audiences, American audiences, Montreal audiences, yeah, you ought to do a little Montreal, a little Toronto, a little, you, you got to do some of that. Yeah. But, uh, and I just, I just think uh, if you believe that you're as good as anyone who's ever been out there, but you're, you don't fall in love with your press releases, you don't get overly impressed with yourself, and you don't, when you walk in, you don't feel like you should have a limo or exercise bicycle in your room and, uh, and blue peanut M&Ms. You ought to see some of the speakers demand to have this or that, and they, they actually believe that they're uh, somebody, I don't know, really special. And I look at them and say, yeah, you know, gosh, you're good, but I mean, you know, you're gonna get old too. I mean, <laughs> and I've seen the best, you know, I've, I mean, Norman Vincent Peale, you know, Ziegler, Paul Harvey, Art Linkletter, Jim Rohn, you, you name them. I've been, been around them all. And I still like the real authentic people who are so genuine that you can feel it in their bones. When they're looking at you, they're not pitching you. They're, you're talking with an audience, not at an audience. You're identifying with that person. And they know it, they can feel it. To me, that's, that's the key. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a huge, huge, huge advice. <laughs> well, I hope, you know, benefit, you know, somewhat in it. But, you know, I'm never going to retire. That's, that's the thing you have to be careful of is retiring. You know, I've made enough money, so I don't need any money. Uh, I have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Wow. So I'm older than your grandfather, you know, probably a lot older. Uh, he's 80, 82, I think. Yeah, well, I'm 80. <laughs> so I'm 80 and, and still going. So uh, China, uh, 30 cities uh, last three months, uh, 20 cities the last few weeks, and I don't get tired. I will send him your video. Yeah, I don't. I will translate it in French to, yeah. to help him to see that. He, yeah. will very, he will be very. Tell him I, I don't get angry because no one's tried to kill me. I don't get uh, upset because uh, things will change. And I really try to treat everyone, not the way I want to be treated, but the way they need to be treated to feel the best they could be. What if, what if you're an idiot and treat everyone the way you want to be treated? So a jerk will treat everyone the way they want to be treated. So someone who is abrasive, obnoxious, conceited, will treat other people arrogantly. Well, that's not the golden rule. The golden rule is to treat everyone the way they need to be treated, to be all they can be according to their own desires. So you really have to crawl in the other person's shoes and give them what they want. So when, when you write your books, keep the reader in mind. Don't tell what you want to tell. Tell them the story that they want to read that they want to hear that will resonate with them and, and then just write 20 books but, but don't settle for one. Wow. You're amazing. <laughs> it's wonderful. And remember applications. Remember uh, thought of the day, golden nugget of the week, leadership tip of the month, application for mobile phones, video clips every day, small video clips on the iPhone so that you develop a chip that can be inserted in the phone and that way you get subscribers all over the world 
who are subscribing to whatever it is that you're giving them and it's going to be sheer application volume so that you become known in this mass of mobile uh, imaging uh, that is going to be uh, a sentence long, not even a tweet long. So a little text here, a little audio here, a little video here, a little thought of the day. Uh, yeah, great. <laughs> I, would, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, yeah. What is the psychology of reading? And I would love to know and to tell the 10 qualities, the 10 traits of people who are, we, who are winners. I think the first is uh, believing in your potential. And how do you do that? I guess you read biographies of people who've overcome enormous obstacles to become successful. And if you read biographies, you'll find out that most people uh, coming from uh, uncommonly difficult backgrounds become uncommonly successful. So that therefore, you don't have to be born with any special head start. So I think the, the idea that uh, I can, I can because other people have. It's possible. That gives you the passport. So you get, the, you, that gives you the passport. And then you say, uh, who will take me there? You say, everyone has good intentions, but they're very busy. So it looks like if I'm going to go fishing, I'm going to have to take myself fishing because if I wait for somebody else to take me fishing, I may wait a long time. So you get behind the wheel <clears throat> and start driving your life and take responsibility for your outcomes by Realizing that every choice has a logical consequence or reward of that choice. So you choose more carefully by thinking before you choose. Um, so I'd, I'd say taking responsibility for outcomes. I'd say the third would be uh, understanding the difference between fear and desire motivation. They're both tremendously strong. Fear tells you you can't, so it's a red light. It tells you you have to, so it's a hammer. It makes you have to do it or something bad will happen. Desire is propulsion rather than compulsion. And desire makes you want to do it and feel you can do it. So better to be motivated on the desire side or reward side than on the penalty of failure side. Penalty of failure works last resort in wartime. It keeps you alive in dangerous situations, but it's no way to live. To live in fear is no way to live at all. You won't take risk because you'll be afraid of the downside. And I think uh, the next thing would be uh, this self-image that we have. Self-esteem is a combination of believing in worthiness, having an identity, belonging to affiliation, and having some competency. But self-image is this imagination of all the different things that a human can be. A lion can't be anything but a lion, but a human can imagine himself or herself to be virtually anything. A wimp, uh, you know, uh, somebody who is a different set of circumstances, the human can, we're the only ones that seem to have this ability to create <clears throat> something that didn't exist before. Animals live and die instinctively, and they learn from other animals, but humans just create something that never existed before out of these thought patterns that we get. So I would say the freewheeling use of the imagination to create something either innovatively or that didn't exist before and not be afraid of it. Then the other thing would be to direct that imagination. Specificity rules the world. You know, if a goal is a dream with a deadline, if a goal is a target, which it is, if when a goal is defined, it becomes understandable by a computer, that's what a goal needs to be to be reached. Because a goal has to have a beginning and a reaching point. It has to have material substance to it so that it can be pictured, talked about, written about, emoted about and becomes a concrete image of achievement in the future, and the mind can't differentiate that between <clears throat> reality and, 
and an image, so a goal must be specified. So I, I, I like to spend my life asking questions. So how much money do you need? Well, what would be your idea of enough? And they said, well, I, no, I want to be rich. And I said, no, no, mine doesn't understand that. Mine doesn't understand peace. Mine understands peace in what way as a result of doing what, of feeling what. When do you want this to happen? When you're my age, how much money would you need after taxes to travel anywhere in the world and have any hospital and have any grandchild ask for help? How much would you need and how much would that be? And if you can define that and project it, you're halfway there. So I would say the specificity of purpose would be uh, one, of the, one of the things. The other thing would be uh, an awareness of your talents. You, you're, you're given five to seven enormous talents when you're conceived. There's 19 possible. So what are you good at? How do you know? Who told you? Life is an exploration of talent. And the sooner you find out what you're gifted, the more you'll like it. And the more you like what you do, the better you're at it. The better you're at it, the more you'll like it. And probably the more money you'll make because you're doing what you love so often. Now, you can't always make money <clears throat> out of your passion. Sometimes an artist doesn't make any money till after they're dead. And unless you're a graphic artist today, it's kind of hard just to sit and paint and make a fortune. But if you love to paint or if you love music, you should not save that for later. You should bring that into play so that you have a balance in your life. But for the most part, I think you should bring your talents to work. So you need to dust off your childhood and think about what you're good at from 5 to 15 and what you can hardly wait to do when you're free. So if you had all the money in the world and time were not an object, what would you be doing with your days? Thank God I'm doing with my days what I enjoy doing. Because people say, why don't you retire? And I said, from what to what? They said, why don't you fish? I said, no, I catch a fish and I eat it. Or I give it to somebody, but I don't want to fish every moment. They say, well, why don't you? And I said, I do. I help orphans and I help this and I go to Africa and I write and I sing and I play, but I, I like to help people. So that having that, uh, that desire for service to plant shade trees under which you will never sit. That's my underlying purpose, to plant sh shade trees for future generations under which I myself will never sit. So that makes me feel like my life is worth spending time on and then having a purpose behind the purpose. I can't think of any other ones other than having a positive expectation. I always expect the best and plan for the worst. I love the uh, serenity prayer. I accept everything that's ever happened to me as being history. I cannot change that. I change whatever I can change, which is my response and my anticipation. So I accept the unchangeable, I change the changeable, and I remove myself from the unacceptable. So things that I don't enjoy, I don't like to be around, I, I'm out. But if it's an obnoxious restaurant, I'm out. If the people are making too much noise, I'm out of there. If there's too much smoke, I go someplace else. So I'm learning that I can remove myself from unacceptable situations and not put myself at risk. But I'm also changing what I can, and the only thing I can change is my anticipation and response. So. I have a positive expectation. I believe I'm going to wake up tomorrow. Uh, I say safe again when I do. I, uh, I explain myself in positive ways. When I'm not feeling well, I, I say I'm feeling better. I'm going to feel better. And I think expectation. I think the way you explain your life is one of the most important communication ways because bad news sells. So the people pass on bad news. Uh, as the fair of the day, that's why all news media is conflagration because uh, good news is elevator music. So if you're a good news person, hardly anyone's going to listen to you. 
unless you solve problems and unless you're showing people how to take the problem they have and and flip it and reverse it so I believe in a positive explanatory style gee Dennis you're not looking so good thank you I'm feeling a lot better yeah I noticed you got some little scabs on your head yes I had some little surgery but you know that, that comes with surfing uh, kind of look like a zip head ziploc head yeah looks a little weird but I'll be better next week does it hurt it hurt at the time but it's being a lot better now thanks for asking so no matter what the situation is you explain toward the expectation and people congregate around the winner's locker room when you're a winner they want to hear it when you're a loser they don't want to hear it even though the news media always talks about what's wrong so you can be the solution person yeah <laughs> great uh, did you have some, had some fears of, at the beginning of your career and how you overcame it of course I'm, I'm human and remember I came from an, a feeling of inadequacy and lower self-esteem so my father could never look at anyone in the eye so it took me 15 years before I could ever develop eye contact usually I would be always looking down in a way always and it was just uh, people in the audience would say who are you who are you looking at were you looking at someone in the front row that you knew <coughs> and I said was I and they said well you were looking down I said wow I guess I inherited that from from our family who always could not develop eye contact <coughs> so I had a lot of fears but I had uh, <coughs> a certain gift to be able to explain things in easy to understand ways so I took I took the lyricist in me so I'm I'm a lyricist and a lyricist is somebody who is unfortunately totally poetic and it maybe doesn't sell as much today but it's my thing so people say okay in 30 words what is it your life and I go the essence of my life is this a baby smile a loved one's kiss a book a tree the sea a friend and just a little time to spend and that's it so I I spend my life trying to lyrically form words that try to get a larger message across in a fewer number of words and that helped me having a good memory and being a lyricist somebody who listened to the radio and listened and listened to be able to spout back things that I'd heard uh, you know things that were proverbs proverbial you know if you don't stand for something you'll fall for anything and winners believe in their dreams when that's all they have to hang on to and and uh, the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth all those kinds of things uh, being able to use cliches when you need to but trying not to be a walking cliche but I wrote the psychology of winning for myself at the worst point in my life so <laughs> it's possible then for someone who's not doing well who is afraid and is tentative about his or her success to reach down in the worst of times to bring the very best out of yourself so I had been a jet pilot I had been a warrior minimal success uh, not too much success uh, met Dr. Saul getting a doctorate but not going anywhere with it and being paid a hundred dollars to speak um, not exactly a fortune uh, speaking to women's clubs and Kiwanis and Rotary and Optimus Club Zig Ziglar and I gave 500 speeches before anyone would even pay us for one so we we went the hard way we went hundred dollars at a time until finally we recorded some that somebody actually clapped 
So we went up through the ranks rather than having a bestseller catapult us into the platform. <clears throat> I mention this only because I think it might be important for anybody in the future. I didn't write the psychology of winning because I was a, an authority on winning. I wrote it because I was an authority on losing. And if you take what you're doing in life and analyze it, and if you were to do the opposite of what you had failed at and made that part of your life, then you could flip it. So instead of being waitly come lately or always late waitly, I became first to the gate waitly or always on time waitly. So I was able to take what I was doing wrong and reverse that with psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics, the ability to reprogram this marvelous uh, autopilot and give myself the things that I wasn't doing. So I wrote about it. I wrote that winners need to be doing this. And fortunately for me, Nightingale Conant did a very good job of direct mailing and they mailed it out and, and they sold a uh, hundred million dollars worth of the one album, one audio album, which was the second audio album ever produced of a speaking voice, Earl Nightingale, Lead the Field, and then, you know, a couple of other ones. But I just got, I, I got very lucky in the sense that timing of their marketing and of the demand in the market and my own need to flip my life around, it just went together. So I had the great fears. I was not, never sure that that was going to be successful. <clears throat> but I had a hunch. I had a, a belief deep down that somehow, some way, that I was going to break through. And you have to have that. I mean, if you don't have that, you just, you'll give up you know, after the third or fourth or 10th or 20th try. So I never, uh, failure was never an option. Great. Failure is fertilizer. A lot of people who are following me have some lack of self-esteem self self and self-confidence. What do you suggest to improve self-esteem and self-confidence? I think to, uh, to take a, uh, a talent audit of oneself, in other words, uh, count your blessings instead of your blemishes. So I would say, uh, what are the things about yourself that you're proud of? Uh, what's in your bag? B is for blessings. What have I been given in my life that I take for granted? My eyes, uh, I can walk, I can talk, I can see, I can think, I can read, I'm young, I'm attractive, I'm this, I'm, what's my bag, my blessings? What have I been given that I, I don't often think about? And then what are my accomplishments? What have I done in my life so far that I'm proud of, little things, anything. From the time I've been young, what, is there anything I can hang on to? Anything that has happened that in times of difficulty or strife that I can say, you know, when the going got really tough, I did that. I remember doing that. I remember feeling that way. And then of course, if you don't have many blessings and you haven't done that much, you really have to hang on to your goals. You have to have this uh, tremendous imagination that makes you believe that you can ratchet your way to the top. So you have to get images of achievement for yourself and break them down into little bite-sized pieces like an Olympian. So when I was chairman of psychology for the Olympics, I gave them stair steps, little teeny things, 90 days, uh, things to do for three months, just little things. And if they went a fraction of a meter or a fraction of a second, they kept raising the bar. And as they accomplished each new little step, it gave them new confidence that they could risk more. If they failed on a little goal, it was easy to correct. 
So instead of having them have impossibly difficult goals, low goal short term. So to, to improve self-esteem, I would say low goal short term. I would say uh, break it down three months, the length of a season. Can't always do it in a month. Things get in the way. Maybe three months, give yourself three months and accomplish something in that season. What are you going to do this summer? What are you going to do this fall? It's the length of a, a business season. It's the length of an athletic season, length of a farmer season. Must must be something to this. And I would I would go low goal short term, and I just keep counting my blessings, and and keep reinforcing my accomplishments and keep reinforcing my goals. Mm, that's great. I love that. Um, you talk also about motivation. Um, According to you, what are this, the secrets of motivation? Motivation, by definition, is an inner force that compels behavior. So if motivation is an inner force that compels behavior, the best motivation is intrinsic, inside, where you can use extrinsic, and we all have that. Extrinsic motivation is material, I want it, competitiveness, I want to be better. Uh, acquisition, I want things. And uh, what else would be, let's see, competitiveness, acquisition, material. That's pretty much the, uh, the outside motivation. Being better, winning the gold medal. <clears throat> Intrinsic is desire for excellence and achievement by independent action. And if you were to take two students and have the student, one, be motivated by desire for excellence and achievement by independent action, and the other motivated by getting good grades and getting into a good college, I guarantee you the intrinsic motivation will win over the long run. That is not to say that extrinsic motivation, money, power, competition, are not important. They're very human. We all want to be somebody, and we want to be somebody in comparison with a world standard. No question, world-class standards. But for my money, intrinsically motivated to be the best you can possibly be from inside out, and having internal values would be the best motivator of all. Be doing it for its own sake. Not because I'm a professional athlete, but because I love the sport. Great. How do you define resiliency and what is it for you? Resiliency is uh, mental toughness, the ability to bounce back after uh, uh, you fail. Very difficult to do, um, but it's one of the traits of an Olympian. Uh, in fact, we look for self-confidence, uh, mental toughness, and ambition. We look for resiliency in an Olympian because they're going to fail a lot. They're going to get hurt a lot, and they're going to fall a lot. They're going to get injured a lot. <clears throat> so we look for the person who's, uh, who's able to say, uh, I, can, I can handle this, that, that failure is always the fertilizer of success. It stinks. We don't like it. We don't want it, but it's inevitable. Don't roll in it. Plant it. So plant failure as the fertilizer of your next success. And resiliency enables you to use experience of a negative nature so that you don't repeat it and it becomes wisdom. Mm. So it's just the ability to learn from the experiences and challenges you have, right? Right, and to find somebody who has overcome either what you failed at or what you're afraid of. But find somebody who's done what you find almost impossible. Uh, a speaker who has the confidence, you know, who goes into an empty room and practices. Um, I mean, I, I do that all the time. I simulate a lot. You know. I absolutely have to go in every meeting room and know exactly what the ambience of the room is. I have to know what the temperature is, if everyone can see. I never blow on the mic, I never tap on it, and I always have the, uh, I, I have the uh, adaptability 
or the resiliency in the form of a contingency. So another thing you can do for resiliency is have a contingency plan B, which means always be prepared for the unexpected. And that's why I have a, a second uh, wireless mouse, why I make sure that the graphics are set, because inevitably in China, somebody always pulls out the little <clears throat> thumb drive. They do something that is just weird and uh, you have a problem. So because mistakes, you don't like to make them, I use a contingency plan because I've been through so many errors before. I anticipate the error and, and that makes me more resilient. And the same thing is true when I'm traveling. I know how to, I know, I know always to have a backup flight. I know how to pack so my clothes aren't wrinkled. Yeah, you know, I just know those things so that those Resilient things are things I plan for now. <clears throat> mm, great. I have a last question. Uh, you were talking about habits and that you believe a lot in the power of habits to succeed in life. Uh, it is two questions. What are the main habits you develop to help you and how we can, can develop a habit? Well, my own belief is that habits are not broken easily. They're replaced. If you look at the way the mind works, the mind works by observation, imitation, and repetition. So everything that we are, we are as a result of who we watch, who we listen to, and what we internalize through practice. So we are modeling our whole lives without even knowing it. So we've modeled ourselves after all these inputs. And that becomes our habit. So if 90% of what we do is habitual, And we don't even think about it. We even take showers the same way. We get dressed the same way. We shave the same way. We do this enormous thing called life habitually. And that's why it's so important to develop healthy habits in the place of the destructive habits. In China, for example, they all smoke, the men, because they copy the Japanese. And they hate the Japanese. So if the Chinese hate the Japanese, Why are all the Japanese men smoking? Because the American men were smoking and we brought cigarettes to Japan. So habit is something that you learn by watching celebrities or watching people and you get into it. And once you're into it, you can't get rid of it because the chains are too strong to break. So a habit is a bed that's comfortable, really hard to get out of. It's a submarine. It runs silent and deep. Uh, It, it goes from cobwebs into cables to strengthen or shackle our lives and therefore we creations of habit. It takes about a year. So the motivational speakers are wrong. They've been wrong all their lives by they saying 21 days. If you do this for 21 days, uh, you can change your life. Are you kidding me? If you've been like you have been for 21 years, And if you've been doing something for a long period of time, it will take you a longer period of time to have the neurons and dendrites connect and jump over each other to connect to make something a reflex action. So it takes about a year of a daily routine to put you in a new habit for life. So what I tell people is, yeah, go on a retreat. Go ahead on the seminar. Go ahead to the island and have the mind-changing, mind-altering weekend. But it's going to take you six months to a year to be the new you. It's going to take you a daily routine, like a subway, get you from one place to the other on a track. It may seem a little boring at first, but Olympians do it, astronauts do it, top salespeople do it, people planning for weddings do it. <clears throat> Habits are most incredible things uh, we have in our life. So you need to uh, have a new software program that you put into the uh, iPhone and you, you put the app in and it says, uh, my breathing is relaxed and effortless. My lungs are pink and clear. Water is my favorite fitness drink. I eat only when I'm hungry. I eat small portions of nutritious food. 
I eat fiber-based carbohydrate. I'm loving, intimate with my family. I'm always on time. I listen to what other people say when they know it. Uh, I'm caring and gentle. Uh, I'm a winner. And it seems routine at first. But I'm telling you, there's nothing like uh, learning how to fly, going through ground school, learning how to be an astronaut, simulation, observation, repetition, repetition, simulation, internalization, realization. Napoleon Hill was right. Conceive it, believe it, repeat it. It, it becomes you. And so, Habits are the, uh, but, but they're, they're learned and, and they're, uh, they're not overnight things. So you don't have a religious experience. You don't say, I've arrived. Billy Graham and I've had a long talk about it. And he is one of the uh, most respected men I know, I have known in my life. And he says, Dennis, you and I are pretty much the same. We go out, tell them what we believe. Some of them come from the outfield or the infield. I said, yes, in your case, there's 90,000 people. In my case, I'm lucky to get a 1,000, especially maybe in China now. And he said, yes, but I tell them what I believe. And I said, yes, but they come down and I see them crying. He said, they go back to being themselves. They believe it in that instant. They want it. But it's going to take them a long time to become that. So I'm an awareness person. I lead them to an awareness. They do it over time, Dennis. I'm not mad at them, neither are you. What is his name? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. He's the most uh, important American evangelist who's ever lived. He's the most powerful uh, uh, <clears throat> Christian. He used to get 100,000 people in Russia to hear him speak. Uh, he's, he's been the most powerful American evangelist. And he admits that instead of making people Christians, he makes them more aware of the evening that they have a possibility of going home and changing over the next year. And I went, wow, I thought you changed lives. He said, no, Dennis, we are not the Messiah. We are self-awareness people. We lead people so that they can find their path and their way, but we don't make the changes in them, they do. So that's why, again, that's why I prefer to just think of myself as somebody that throws seeds out, some of them take and a lot of them don't. I don't think I've changed any lives other than my own. Wow. <laughs> it's great. Thank you very much.